Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Well, we do this once a month called Elevate Nights. If you're here for the first time, or maybe you've never experienced an Elevate Nights, it normally goes from 7 to 9 p.m. And the reason being is because, you know what, we always have our regular church services, which on Sunday, you know what, you can only do so much. We have three services. And, um, and be praying, because you know what, I know eventually we're going to have to go to four, because uh, we've had some challenges here and there where there's either not enough seats or just way too crammed. And so uh, how many would come if I did a, a Saturday evening service? Lift your hand up. Would you come to Saturday evening, like around five. Wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. How many would come at a Sunday evening service, like a 5 p.m. Sunday? Oh, I, I ain't, we ain't doing it. We ain't doing it. We ain't doing it. <laughs> you lost. We ain't doing it. That, that's for sure. That ain't going to happen. Probably be us four no more. Yeah. I want to bring a word. We, we sang this song. Wasn't worship amazing? We sang this song, um, you know, Lord, you know, get us to move, right? Help us move. How many are ready to move forward with some things in their life? Okay. If that's true, then you better listen tonight. Look at the person next to you and say, you better not distract me tonight. <laughs> Tom, and if you need to go to the bathroom, Tom, you better go right now. I don't want to, see, there goes one. Do I get two? Those are two. No, no. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. She's one of our leaders. She's cool. <laughs> Jessica's awesome. She, she'll forgive me. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you that we're not just singing lyrics that say, Lord, we want to move. We're ready to move. Tonight we came with expectation, and thank you, Father, for being here. I pray that you would speak to every single one of our hearts, Father. Think through my mind, speak through my mouth. And I just pray, Father, that you would uh, help us take something away tonight to really get us to that place of moving forward with the things that you have for us. And Father, we thank you that tonight there's just a spirit of rest, a spirit of peace, and I thank you for that spirit of unity. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're about to do tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, go with me real quick. If you have your Bibles, go in your Bibles. If you have a technical device, you can use your iPad, iPhone. I don't know what you use. But Psalms 119 Verse 18 says this. It says, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Say it with me, Lord, Lord. Open, open my eyes. Better yet, why don't you put your hands over your eyes and say, Lord, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things in your law, in his word. Right? So many, so many times we want God to show us something, but God already gave us what we need to see, and it's found in his word. And so um, I'm going to start telling you a story, and this is a true story. And this is a book that I'm actually ordering for myself, and it's a man by the name of Russell Conwell. And this guy wrote a book in the 1800s. I'm not going to give you the title of the name just yet. Remind me to give it to you at the end of service, okay? Before I end, just say, what's the title? Then you can order it, and I'm sure you'll be blessed. But this guy, uh, Russell Conwell, is someone who wrote a book in the 1800s. Mind you, 1800s. And he sold 7 million copies. Just think about this. This guy sold 7 million copies, and he didn't have... Radio, TV, social media, he didn't have anything. He just wrote a book that really inspired him to do something special with that book. Because what he ended up doing is he ended up um, building a university called Temple University. Has anyone ever heard of Temple University? It's in Pennsylvania. Okay, Temple University to this day still stands and is a very well-known university. And this man who wrote the book and sold 7 million copies of ended up using all the funds to start Temple University. And it's amazing how this guy had such a big dream. As a matter of fact, you know what they called him? They called him the penniless millionaire. 
because he used all his money. He gave it all back to that school. And then to see here from 1800 to the 21st century and to see that something is still standing because of one man who had a vision, how amazing is that? 1800. So in this uh, book, he writes a story. He writes many stories. He's a great storyteller. And, but he was giving some facts of some true stories of people that, uh, that he encountered and who shared real stories about other people that have experienced some pretty, some pretty gnarly things in their life. And, um, and this true story that he begins to share is that he's, he's traveling to, to India. Can I get an amen? <laughs> the struggle is real. So this man goes to India, Anusha. And, uh, and he goes to India, and he has, he has a guide. So he's exploring. He's, he's, he's just gathering information, and he's exploring. So he's got this guide who's with him, and this guide um, is riding camels with him in, in, in the depths of India, in the desert. And they're now sitting at a bonfire, and, and they start having conversation. And the guide begins to share a story with... Uh, Mr. Conwell, and he says, uh, let me share a, a true story to you. He says, I don't share this with just anybody. I share this with just special, you know, special customers of mine, and I, I think you need to hear this. And he was sharing about a farmer, and, uh, and this farmer lived in South Africa, and his name was Ali Hafid. And Ali Hafid was living in South Africa, and this farmer was not a rich farmer. He was a struggling farmer. He had a farmland. He had an ox. He had a plow. And he had a log cabin. And he worked tirelessly every single day just trying to survive. It was a wheat farm. And uh, he had a wife and, and either one or two children. And, and this man was exhausted he was tired and and I mean just like just think of it I mean today in our in our culture some of us we work hard and you're just you know you're barely making it some of us sometimes are, are, are struggling you've been in a moment in your life where you were just living paycheck to paycheck and you're working hard you're not being lazy this guy is working the farm his land and he's he's doing his best to provide for his family and long behold one day this uh, this traveler comes out to him and uh and he begins to speak to the farmer and uh and this guy was basically telling him he was just traveling by and he says hey i see that you're uh you know you're working super hard here how's the farm going and he began to tell him well you know it's just just scraping by and uh and the guy said well you know um in india this is the guy from south africa he says in india He's like, there's this place. Um, it's called the uh, the Moon Diamond. Don't quote me. The Moon, the Moon, the Moon something. The Moon River. And in this Moon River, there are diamonds. And he said, and 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 this, the truth is this: in the 1800s, there was a big movement of diamonds in India. And if you don't believe me, you can ask Anusha. And so it was true. So obviously he couldn't go to Google and be like, oh, I wonder if there's any diamonds in India. No, it was, it was actually a fact that there was a major movement of diamonds. So this guy begins to tell him, you go there and you go to the river and it's called the Moon Valley. And at the Moon Valley, you can literally put your hand into the rivers and you can begin to, you know, pull out diamonds. And, you know, the guy just heard the term. He said, you can have wondrous riches and so in his mind he's thinking man I'm struggling I don't know how much longer I can live like this for the rest of my life you know trying to grow wheat and so in his mind he's like okay so where is this again he explained to him where it's at the location and the farmer goes to his wife and he says honey I got us an amazing opportunity I'm going to go to India, and I'm going to go and, and, and find diamonds, and we are going to live the riches of the rich. Our life will change forever. And his wife agreed with him. 
And so the guy ends up selling his farm. He sells his ox. He sells his plow. He sells everything, the cabin. He sells it, and he gets money, and he gives money to his wife and his kids, and he says, okay, you know, this will hold you up until I get back. And he gives the family a hug, and the guy, he takes off to, to India. So now he's in India, and he's at the very place that the traveler told him about, and he's digging, and he's working it, and he's working it, and he's working it. So this guy kept doing this. This farmer kept digging in the river over and over and over. He exhausted all of his resources and had nothing. Nothing. So now, how many think that this guy would be disappointed? He, sold, he has nothing left. How is he going to come back and tell his wife, we have nothing so the guy, true story, so the guy, he writes a suicide note. And on the suicide note, he wrote very clear, there were no diamonds anywhere. And then he went to this river where the, the river was raging, and he threw his body in the river, and he died. Now, here's the interesting part, okay? The guy who bought the farmland from the guy who committed suicide, he bought the same horse or the ox, the same plow, the same old wood cabin. The la he bought everything from him. And this guy starts working the land, and as he's working and tilling the land, you know what, he starts noticing as he's hitting these, these, these rocks, because when you're plowing, you got a, you got your, your ox and you got your plow, and it's like, uh, just imagine all. So this guy's not rich. He's struggling as well. He's, he's, he's experiencing the same exact thing the last guy was. However, as the guy starts expanding his plowing in the land, he starts hitting some ugly rocks. And there were some really uh, black, ugly rocks. But if the sun hit the rocks just fine, just perfectly, there would be like, like this glistering glow, almost like a rainbow type of thing. And so he just kept piling them and piling them to the side and kept plowing and trying to grow his wheat. And, uh, and then one day he, he was just kind of walking back to his cabin and he saw this one beautiful rock that he thought was gorgeous. He's just like, okay, well, this one's really nice. It just glows beautiful. And so he grabs this big, ugly black, black rock and he brings it into the cabin. He puts it on the mantle of the fireplace and he just sits it there. Well, this guy had been, you know, on the land for maybe a few months, maybe three months, two months. And in those times, obviously, when people visited you, it'd be very, very rare how soon they can get to you. But this priest ends up showing up to his house. And the priest walks in. He says, how you doing, sir? Um, I just wanted to welcome you to, you know, our community. So great. And the, guy, and the guy's just talking to him. And while the priest is talking to him in the house, he looks up at the mantle, and the priest says, do you know what you got up there? And, and, and the guy's like, yeah, it's a stupid rock. He's like, I've been plowing my farm every single day. And he's like, uh, I, I just keep throwing them to the side. He's like, okay, where are they? He's like, they're everywhere. Anywhere you want, they're everywhere. <laughs> and the priest is like, you don't know what you have, do you? And the farmer said, uh, yeah, I do. It's a rock. He said, no, see, what you don't understand is that you have something very special right there. He said, here's what happens. He said, what you found was a diamond in the rough. And the farmer's like, come again? I'm not making that up now. I don't know if he said that. <laughs> I would have said, I would have been like, say what? <laughs> 21st century. Okay, so he tells, the priest tells him, I'm going to go somewhere with this. Relax. So the priest tells him, the priest tells him, all you have to do, man, is you got to cut through that rock. And when you cut through that rock, you're going to find some diamonds. And so he said, okay, so just cut the rock. So this farmer then goes ahead and he cuts the rock. And long behold, he found the first diamond. And this diamond was worth $25,000 in the 1800s. 25 grand. Some of us wish we had 25 grand right now. This is the 1800s. And so he starts 
obviously doing what any of us would do. And he starts grabbing all the rocks and he starts cracking them. And obviously he starts pulling out all the diamonds. And, and th this man became so filthy rich. As a matter of fact, today they call this land, and it still exists today. And I'm going to find the name of it right here. The name of that, of that place where that still pulls out millions and millions and millions of dollars to this day, 21st century, is a place called Rotonda Diamond Mines. Mind you, think about this. The guy who committed suicide never realized that he was actually living on acres of diamonds. That sounds like, come up, like some of us, right? Some of us, we don't realize the diamond in the rough. Some of us here tonight, we don't realize that there's something special that God has invested in us. There is a mystery treasure that the Lord has placed inside of us that we have failed to actually come to the realization that there is more inside of you that meets the eye. That's why the psalmist said, Lord, open my eyes so that I can see. I believe, how does this apply to me, Pastor? This applies to us because I believe that more than ever in the 21st century church, there is spiritual poverty in believers. There's such a great spiritual poverty. We don't know where we get our healing from. We don't know where miracles come from. We don't know where our peace comes from. Like we, we, it's almost like we look at the grass that's greener on the other side. We, we covet the gifting of other people. We covet the calling of other people. We covet the marriages of other people. We covet the children of other people, but we don't even realize the diamond in the rough. And are you willing to die never realizing that God has left a hidden treasure inside of you? You know what that treasure is? It's the Holy Spirit. And he's alive in you. And he's alive in me. And how many of us treat him like he's still dead? He's called the resurrection life. Just think. He's the resurrection life life do we even have the the spiritual intelligence the spiritual connection with that word jesus said i i don't leave you an orphan i'm not leaving you to die i'm leaving you a helper and the helper is the holy spirit there is so much spiritual bankruptcy in the church we have such poor mindsets we we're always looking for something better. We're always chasing something that we claim is going to give us more peace. We're always chasing something that's going to make us more happy. We're always exchanging the treasure for dirt in the water that has nothing. Are you with me tonight? And so I, I, I want you to get this, this big panoramic picture tonight that anything that you're facing anything that you're struggling with anything that that you're dealing with the treasure the answer the prosperity the healing the breakthrough the whatever it is you need the resurrection power is already inside of you and we have to start tapping into that we have to start realizing and accept that God is not fool's gold no the only fool is us we keep fooling ourselves, thinking that we're not enough, that he's not enough. How many know that God is more than enough? Amen. So we have to come back to this place and realize that there's, there is a special treasure. That's why I love this verse, and I wanted to start with this because he says, Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. That God would allow us to see, wait a minute, there's an answer for whatever it is I'm facing. The problem is that we're too lazy to plow. I'm sorry, did I offend someone? Yes or no? We, don't, we want someone to fix us, touch me and heal me. No, it's not going to work that way. 
Think about it. Even a diamond in the rough, it ain't a diamond until someone cuts it. Even to find the diamond in the rough, it's got to be plowed. So in other words, obviously we have to understand that there is a process to experience and discover and get a hold of the diamond. And so often we do not want to do the work, right? We just want to go ahead and let someone else tell us what we want to hear instead of open my eyes, Lord, so that I can see the wondrous things that you have for my life in this world word this is where the riches are outside of this we're struggling we're poor we're, we're in poverty and, and God God's trying to renew our minds that's why we started this series called stretch because obviously yes we got to stretch our faith but how many you got to stretch it the way you think as well a lot of our poverty comes as a man thinks so what so is he so we we think it stinketh got to open our eyes and we got to ask God, God, open my eyes to vision. Open my eyes to healing. Open my eyes to purpose. Open my eyes to this breakthrough that I open my eyes to whatever it is that you need. God to open your eyes in. But we got to cut it out, don't we? Got to get it out. See, the baby agrees. <laughs> Baby's even crying. Come on. See? Don't worry, baby. We're going to do it. <laughs> Don't cry for us. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 26. The reason I'm bringing this to us tonight is because I think that, that most believers are afraid of the treasure of the Holy Spirit. Because how many know that the Holy Spirit is not a ghost? He's not goosebumps. And he's not smoke in the sanctuary. Okay, that's an actually, that's a smoke machine in the back, Okay. <laughs> Don't, don't be the person like, oh, do you feel him right now? He's right here. Oh, my God. He's, no, no, he's not, he's, not, he's not the hairs that are standing on your arm. You know what I'm saying? He is a person. Now, yes, do we feel his presence? Yes. There's times where we, can, we, know, we know God is right here. Like, like tonight during worship, like, man, I can feel his presence. I can feel. I can smell God. How about you? Right? And so there's, there are those moments, but you can't live off that, right? And so I think that the... The biggest issue with us is that we push back the treasure of praying in the spirit. We do. A lot of us, we pray, but we don't pray in the spirit, not realizing that praying in the spirit is your map quest to destiny. There's only so much you can pray in your native language. Okay, tell me how that's working. I think for me, sometimes it's okay because I'll pray and I still feel the same. How about you? I'll pray for something to change. It ain't changed. But there's something about praying in the spirit. My situation didn't change, but I got changed. Right? The situation, the circumstance is still the same stuff, the same drama, the same issue. But there's something inside. The Holy Spirit begins to strengthen me. The Holy Spirit begins to give me hope. The Holy Spirit begins to empower me, enlighten me. The Holy Spirit begins to help me like Jesus promised he would do. He says, I leave you the helper the Holy Spirit, but it's not, he's not Casper, the friendly ghost. He is the Holy Spirit. He is the Spirit of God. Listen to me. He is, the, he is the Spirit of God. Why do we reject? Why do we keep pushing back the Holy Spirit, praying in the Spirit, being baptized with praying? It? Why do we push it back and want to go to the other side thinking that it's greener over there, there's a greater blessing over there? No. Why would you push back the law. This is where we have to get to. If you're someone who struggles with praying in tongues, speaking in tongues, let me tell you something. You got to ask the Lord to open your eyes. Open my eyes that I may see what your word says. Show me the wondrous things. And I'm going to know that praying in your, in your prayer language, in your heaven language, is wondrous. The Bible says that we, we speak mysteries when we pray in the spirit. Let's get to the verse. Romans 8 verse 26. Are you here? It says, and in a similar way, it says the Holy Spirit takes hold of us in our human frailty to empower us in our what? Weakness. For example, at times, we, even, we don't even know how to pray. Have you ever been in a situation like, man, how do I pray for this one? Like, like this thing is falling apart. How do I even start praying about it? Let me tell you how. You pray in the Spirit. Let's keep reading why. 
For example, at times we don't even know how to pray or know the best things to ask for. Come on, that, that tells me that sometimes we're not asking for God's very best. We're just asking for our best. But the Holy Spirit rises up within us. Where does he rise up? Within us. To super intercede on our behalf, pleading to God with emotion. With what? Emotional. Does the Holy Spirit have feelings? Do you think he gets hurt every time you ignore him? He feels. See, so feelings are a gift from heaven. There's nothing wrong with us being emotional because obviously God has emotions. And if we're made in the image and likeness of God, and if the Holy Spirit is the person of God, if he is the presence of God, if he is the spirit of God, and the Holy Spirit also has the emotions of God, then I wonder how I make him feel every day of my life. I wonder how he feels when I ignore the fact that when I'm, I'm asking everybody to pray for me and he's inside saying, hey, tag me in. I'll empower you. Pray, but listen, but you pray in the spirit. Let's keep reading. Okay, so everybody say that to me. The Holy Spirit's my guide. And, and, and here's your guide. Think about this. He will reveal the mysteries. He will reveal the things that are unknown to you. Uh, I'm going to share this. I've shared this maybe many years ago, but I'm going to share it again. I'll never forget when I was impressed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we had just bought a house, our first house. And, man, it was a miracle just to get a house. And we finally got this house, and we were excited. We are like, yes, praise God. We've been believing for this thing for years, years. We were the first ones to buy a house in my family generation. To buy a house. Wow. I was the first sibling to buy a house. Now all my sisters and brothers, they all got houses and everything now. But I was the first. I was the first to come to Christ. I was the first to get a house. I was the first to elevate my life. And then, you know what? When my life was elevated, my whole family got elevated. They all, they all came. We all come from poverty. But all of my siblings, they're all doing very well. They're, they're in business. They're doing amazing, okay? But it all started with one seed. You know what that tells you? that you can change the, the next generation. You can change your family line because of your obedience. You can change it. Okay, going back to the story, because if not, I'll forget. So I'll remember, we so just bought the house. We were probably in this house maybe a year. And I felt impressed. Now, I didn't hear the voice of God. I didn't hear angels speak and sound the trumpets. I was just impressed, and that's how the Holy Spirit speaks to me at times. I just feel impressed, but how many know that as we've been preaching on this faith message, remember, do you guys remember the definition of faith? Faith is being what? Uncertain, but being confident in God at the same time. So I was uncertain. Is this me or is this God? And here's what I was impressed. Sell your house. Sell your house. We just bought the house. I've been believing you for this house for what you and to my wife, oh, you know, I feel impressed that the Lord's saying, you know, we got to sell this house. I did say, I said something like that. And she said, she said, no, 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 we're not selling this house. No, I've been believing God for this house. And so it was a no. So, so, so I was like, okay, no. God is my witness right now as I'm telling you this. Within a month or two months is when the market crashed. Now, check this out. One thing I did before I came to tell her this, so our home at that time, when the, remember when the market was crazy high, like crazy? You guys remember that market? It was, it was like stupid, ridiculous market. So, like, my home was worth, like, almost $850,000. Didn't even buy it for that. Nowhere near that. But it was stupid money. And so we could have walked away. 300 grand. Clear. The market crashed. How do you think I was? Uh, I was ticked. Why do I share this with you? Because so often we reject 
receiving the impression of the Holy Spirit because our emotions are too attached to this earth. And when you're emotionally attached to your ideas, to your feelings, to your ideology, you'll never experience the move of the Holy Spirit the way he wants to move you. You'll never experience it. You'll just sit in this church and whatever church you go to, because I know we got probably visitors from the church. You'll still be the, you'll be the same old Christian you were from the moment you came to Jesus. Yeah. Nothing will change. Nothing. Think about it. When we stand before God and we start complaining and saying, well, God, you didn't do this. You, God's going to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, I've equipped you. Isn't that what the Bible says in Ephesians? I've equipped you with every spiritual gift that came from above. You have no, I gave you all the tools. I gave you, I gave you the wisdom. I gave you the insight. I gave you the tools. I gave you every spiritual gift. See, so we're spiritually bankrupt, right? Or some of us may be in a spiritual poverty mindset. And God's saying, I have left you with my riches and my treasure. And you may not know it yet. But tonight we can change that. We can change that. We can shift tonight. So if you've been someone who's been pushing back the Holy Spirit, if you've been pushing back this whole thing of speaking, no, that's, that's for charismatic churches. Who even came up with the term charismatic? People. Who came up with the term, you know, uh, Baptist? Episcopalian? Who came up with all these terms? Man did. I said we get back to God's holy word. And we say, Lord, now you open our eyes so that we can see the wondrous things that you have in here. Let me give you another verse quickly. I got to go. Where's my iPad? The music means they want me to end. Okay, 1 okay, Corinthians 14, 4, quick. It says, the one who speaks in tongues advances his own what? How many want to advance their spiritual progress? No, seriously, how many want to advance their spiritual progress? You pray in the Spirit. There's no other way. You pray in the Spirit. You know what? When you pray in the Spirit, not only do you progress, not only do you advance your spiritual progress, you advance your children's spiritual progress. You know why? Because I have learned that in the years that I raised both my kids, I can still remember where the Holy Spirit has told me, hey, uh, Isaac's lying to you about his grades. Like, say what? He's lying to you about his, yeah, his grades. He's not. Isaac, uh, the Holy Spirit just told me you were lying to me about your grades. Is it true that your grades aren't the way you said they were? Yeah, Dad. Ask my kids. Where's Alexis? Somewhere on you. I, the Holy Spirit will give you discernment. The Holy Spirit will tell you things that you can't even understand about you. You need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will tell you when your kid is thinking of harming themselves. The Holy Spirit will wake you up in the middle of the night and say, something is wrong. The Holy Spirit will reveal things to you before they even happen. He can do that, but that needs spiritual progress. Does it happen overnight? Like, you mean tonight, Pastor, I'm going to go home and I'm going to be spiritually wise? No, you're going to go home and you're going to start growing to be spiritually wise. Because you're a diamond in the rough. And there's got to be some cutting that needs to take place inside. Give the Lord a bigger hand clap than that. And if you're still sitting here like, no, no, no. Okay, no, no worries. It's all good. You do you, we do us. It's no big deal. No one's hating. And sometimes there have been people that have been filled with the, because listen, we all have the Holy Spirit. You all been baptized with the Holy Spirit. You know how? When you said, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord. You got the Holy Spirit. You know what's missing in most Christians? Think about it. Two things are heavily attacked in Christianity. Number one, tithing. Anytime you say, okay, let's receive. Oh, they just want my money. Why, 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 why do people attack that? Why do Christians, it's not even the world that, the world's like, okay, yeah, I'll give. It's Christians that get weird. You know why? Because the devil knows that if he gets you to disobey God and not trust God with your finances, then he can get you in a place where you trust you and you don't trust him. Read your, read your penny, read your dimes, your nickels. It says, in God we trust. Because if you don't trust him, then stop using that money. 
Yes or no? Might as well just stop using the money, right? What's the second thing that always gets attacked in the church? Praying in the, in the spirit, praying in tongues. You know what they call praying in tongues? They said that's the devil's language. Christians say that, not the world. The world is actually like, whoa, that's kind of cool, like spiritual connection, woo. Mm, sure, la, la, la. Yeah, like, <laughs> they love it, man. They're like, dang, that's so awesome. And us Christians are like, oh, no, no, praise God. No, 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 no. We got treasure and don't even realize it. He advances his own spiritual progress, your own spiritual progress, your own spiritual progress, while the one who prophesies builds up the church. So when you pray in tongues, let me tell you something, and there's order in this house. If you've been here long enough, you know I'm not funky. I don't, we don't just start going, everybody, no, 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 I always explain it. Okay, here's what we're about to do. See, praying in the spirit edifies you. Prophecy edifies the church. So when I say, okay, church, we're going to pray in the spirit, I'm leading you to build you up. You ain't building up the rest of the people. That's, that's between you and God. Let's keep reading. Look, he says this, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, quickly. He says, when someone speaks in tongues, no one understands a word he says because he's not speaking to people. I'm not like, it's not like, it's, it ain't for you. <laughs> Even when I pray for people, and sometimes I'll be like, shit, you know what I'm doing? I'm not praying for her. I'm praying, Holy Spirit, tell me what is it that I'm not seeing? Tell me what is it that I need to tell her? Tell me what word of knowledge, what prophecy, what wisdom do you want me to give her? Father, only you know her. I don't know her, but you know her. And so, shere le because see, I can pray, God, uh, what does she need? Uh, God, I don't know what she's going, or I can just pray in the spirit. Where Romans 8, 20 says, you pray the perfect prayer. He's not speaking to people, but to God. Who are you speaking to? When you pray in tongues, who do you speak to? Do you speak to people? No, you speak to God. He is speaking intimate mysteries in the what? Spirit. So it's your spiritual language that connects with God. It's your spiritual language. It's your spirit man. The Holy Spirit goes and gets in between. This is the way it looks like. Uh, let me have you two, please. You stand over here, please, Jessica. Jessica and Jessica. <laughs> They're both Jessicas. Jessica, you stand over there. You're God, okay? You're the Holy Spirit middle. I'm the flesh. So I'm going through stuff, right? So when I pray in English, you know, Heavenly Father, we just thank you. And Holy Spirit's standing there, didn't leave. Holy Spirit's just like, amen. All right. But then you get into the place where you're just praying those redundant prayers. Have you ever prayed those? Just redundant. Like, they, you don't even feel it, and you don't even mean it. You're just like, oh, God, I just pray you just, you bless my business today. But there was, like, no depth to that. Like, God, I just pray that you protect my children. But you know you didn't even feel that. You didn't go to war for that. You just said, God, protect my children. But it didn't come from a place of war for your children. And so you start praying, Father, I pray. I plead the blood of Jesus over Isaac and over Alexis. No weapon formed against them will prosper. They'll be blessed going in and blessed going out. And I declare, Father God, for healing and breakthrough and favor in the name of Jesus. And then I go, Then the Holy Spirit says, oh, okay, I got you. And the Holy Spirit then goes, and then walks to God. And then starts telling God, and see now, I don't even know what I'm praying. I didn't ask for actresses, I asked for volunteers. Golly. Okay, I guess they would probably, I don't know. That's... So they're, and they are intercessors too, both of them, which is amazing. Okay, so then, then the Holy Spirit comes and says to God, turn around. And then you start telling her, that they go deeper than my prayer, what I was saying. Jessica, talk out loud. Give her a microphone. Here, I got one right here. Turn this one on. Okay, go ahead. Remember I was praying about protection, favor, 
uh, guidance. Okay, let's try it. Let's play. Okay, go ahead. All right. So you just kind of pretend you're Holy Spirit now. Because remember, I pray my, my, the best I can, but you pray the deep things that are in my soul, in my spirit, man. You, you, inter, you interpret what I'm saying with a heaven language. <laughs> and this is a test. So Jesus, I'm praying to Jesus. I'm Holy Spirit. So I, I, I declare that Isaac will live and not die and declare the good works of the Lord. I declare that Isaac will be faith, full of favor and prosperous, that Isaac will be protected by you, that Isaac will have be, be um, fulfill every destiny that we've called him to fulfill, that Isaac will do everything that he's supposed to do. Okay. But way deeper. <laughs> that was pretty good. Okay, that was good. Give her a big hand. That was good. Holy Spirit. That's pretty good for being put on the spot, right? Not bad. So then the Holy Spirit, so that God the Father does what? I answer the prayer. You say yes. Yes and amen. Yes and amen. That's all the Father does. Amen. And then, and then, and then she's like, why does she get the easy job? <laughs> Here's why, because you used to be her leader. So the test was really for you. Should we keep her or should we let her go? No, okay, okay, we'll keep her. So then, so then, so then, what happens is the Holy Spirit comes, and then just put your hand, your hand on my on my shoulder, please, and then gives me rest. And now I feel like, okay, everything's gonna be all right. And that's how the Holy Spirit. Thank you, guys. Good, good, good big hand. Do you guys get this? Okay, let me give you three points in a in a poem, real quick. Once you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to do that tonight for you guys. We're still good. We still got a few minutes. I know we haven't received tithes and offerings, but we're going to do that in a bit. But let's listen to this. Three points I'm going to give you. Once you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you'll experience three things. Okay? This is when you activate your language. Number one, your circumstances may not change, but you change. Number one, you change. That means transformation starts happening. You become a different man. You become a different woman of the Holy Spirit. You begin to receive the power to overcome sin. You begin to have the power to overcome lies. You begin to receive power to overcome challenges in your life. You begin to get power in how you see. Why? Because you prayed, open my eyes to see, Lord, that I may see the wondrous works of God. And the only one that can show you the wonders is the Holy Spirit. So number one, change. Number two, number two, when you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in your heavenly language. I want nobody moving. I don't care if it's late. Nobody moves, okay? This is a holy moment. Conflict will happen. You know why? Because the enemy's already working hard to keep you from his presence. So once you start getting the treasure, once you find the treasure, the enemy is worried now. Because you are now a dangerous asset in the hands, in the, in the hands of God. You're dangerous. So what happens? Conflict starts happening. Your mind gets in the way. Your mind starts telling you, oh, that's stupid. That's you talking. You're talking. Oh, you're praying that. Oh, that's you. That ain't God. Here's what I always tell people that struggle with the spirit. I always say this. Yeah, yeah, you know what? You're right. Because all people are like, well, that's me saying it. I'm like, uh, duh. Yeah, it is. It starts with you, but it ends with God. Just like faith. It started with me saying, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and be my Savior. But it ended with him saving my soul. So it always starts with you. Yes, that is correct. That's the conflict that we see in church today. There's a conflict of the mind. That's why God says it. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. No more spiritual poverty. So you become a man of war, a woman of war in the spirit. You don't pray the same. You don't pray like, oh, God, I just, no. Man, you go to battle. You start, you start praying. When you're praying from the spirit, you, start, you pray different. Rodolfo, you, you, you'll, start, you'll start pacing like a lion. Man, no. The devil, you are out of this house. You are not bringing confusion to my children. Devil, you may have come in one way, but you're going to be running seven ways. You will not have my... And you start... You become a man or a woman of war. Or you can pray how you pray. Father, just protect my babies. And that's cool. That's how it should start. But it's not how you should finish your walk with God. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be that way. You'll fight different. You'll fight different, I'm telling you. 
You won't fight like this weak, defeated man or woman. You won't fight in fear. You'll fight uncertain, but you'll fight with confidence. That's the difference. And number three, when you pray in the Holy Ghost, it's going to produce growth. Spiritual maturity. It's not about how much theology you know. I'm telling you, I have friends that know so much word, but live so defeated. They know more scripture than me. And they'll even quote it on me. But I look at their life. I look, I look at the fruit. I'm like, wait a minute. All that theology is not working for you, man. You got a lot of word, but you don't have a lot of spirit. Because, listen, the word without the spirit, it's dead. The word needed the spirit. Jesus is the word. The Holy Spirit is what brought it to life. You need the Holy Spirit. Not an option. I know I'm messing up some theology here on some people that you've been taught different. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel condemned tonight. Just open your eyes. Lord, open my eyes. He didn't give, I didn't give you my opinion tonight. I gave you the word. I gave you the scripture. I'm not giving you my ideas. I'm telling you what the Bible says. So when, when you grow, you grow spiritually mature. It's, it's not about how many scriptures you memorize. It's about spiritual maturity, and that only comes when the Spirit breathes life on that word that you have inside of you. Outside of that, you're dead. That's why Christians get bored of Christianity, because it's just word, no spirit. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.